Mercury, Mercury Stardust She's a beacon of hope in the darkest night Mercury, Mercury Stardust She'll teach you how to make it all alright Hey there, hi, my name is Mercury and I'm the trans handy ma'am My pronouns are she, her, and I teach compassionate DIY We're here to help renters, LGBTQIA members, and anyone who's feeling left out in a DIY space Hey guys, gals, and non-binary pals, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Handy Ma'am Hotline. This week I'm joined by two people who aren't Maggie Conrad. <laughs> I'm joined by my executive producer, the wonderful Basil. <laughs> and then I'm joined by my wonderful best friend, my weirdo, and the future driver desk security <laughs> of the Mercury Stardust Media, the wonderful Danny. Hey. Um, okay, this format of this episode is dramatically different. Typically, we come on here and I answer questions that you guys uh, who are listening send me, and I will do the best I can. Now, today we're doing differently. I'm going to teach you about the history of an object or a thing in the industry that we all take for granted, okay? But before I reveal what that is, I want to ask both of you, what do you know about the Philip screwdriver head. Anything? Do we know anything about this thing? It's not a flathead. <laughs> yeah. It's not a flathead. Okay, okay. Do do you know who invented the Philip screw? No. Oh. Uh was it Philip? Okay. I'm going to get into it, but weirdly no. Weirdly no. Philip put his fucking name on it because he's kind of a dickhead but not yeah it gets spicy but not the one who invented it okay now i'm also going to throw this one out there to matthew allen Hag, who is the sound person for this podcast matthew are you listening i am i would hope so because you're literally recording the podcast matthew do you know anything about the screwdriver head henry ford used them oh (laughs) coming in red hot Oh, he's not wrong. So that is, weirdly enough, one of the reasons why we use it so commonly now. Mm. But we're going to get into the spicy, spicy history of it. Have you ever thought about, like, screw bits and why bits are the, the, the certain way they are? Ask me questions, you two. <laughs> something, something. The only thing I'm thinking about screwing bits is not podcast appropriate. <laughs> I... I feel like... First of all, this podcast is everything goes, okay? Like, this is, there's no way we're going to talk about screw bits and shit and not get inappropriate, okay? We're screwing, we're driving, we're ready to go. Yeah, we're twisting, we're turning. Ooh, sometimes we're going to, you know, cam out and sometimes we're going to cam in, you know what I mean? Why are the bits the way they are? Yeah, ooh, well, that there's, there's a thing there. So, before, like, 1900s, right? Before... The turn of the 20th century, the most common bit you would see would be the flathead bit, right? You know what I'm talking about? Just the slot Mm -hmm. head, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why that was so commonly used for so long, we're talking like thousands of years and shit, is because it was easy to reproduce. Super fucking easy to reproduce. It really became more of a thing back in like the the 15th or the 14th century. Armor became really well known with it yeah it was a good way to fashion armor so that was where it became more widely used because of the the the, the screw itself the actual threads of a screw that dates back like two thousand years or something two or three thousand years but a head for it wasn't always something that you would see so that's when they would add in the flathead or the slot and that was a thing that was more commonly used in the 14th century if they didn't have the head, how did they... It would be like a twist. It would be like just a flat thing. Like a carer's bulb. Do you know what I'm... Do you know what no. I'm, so, it, essentially, you would have a pliers or a wrench that would just twist it in. And the head itself, like, when we think of a screw now, we think of it having, like, a flat head, right? Mm-hmm. That resets in. That's not how they were, mm-hmm. right? Screws were more like... They, they had more of a bulky head, Right. And yeah, 100%. That's more what, what it is. Okay. Now, this 
the way that the what you just showed me and the what that I'm holding right now, these are more rounded off. This is still not what you would have seen 600, 700 years ago, right? Because mass pro- this is mass produced right. in a factory, and that's why they look this clean and that nice. Well, you got to think that they were individually made, mm. right? So they were imperfected, and they were you know all different kinds of things. But they started to like put in notches, like around the 1700s, the 1800s. They started putting like notches into them that were more deeper. But the problem with flatheads, and anyone who's ever used a flathead knows that you don't get a lot of torque, mm-hmm. right? Like you, a flathead will slip the right out. Yeah. And you will sometimes completely lose it. But flatheads and screws in general are really good for, like, manufacturing, like, with metal. Really great for, like, some houses and some fasteners. They're just, like, really good universal things. So there was a need to have more torque and to make that process a lot fucking easier. So there was, like, a, weirdly enough, there was, like, a race for a, a hot minute. Between, like, the 1880s to the 1920s, there was, like, a fucking weird-ass race where a lot of people were, like, trying to find a patent for some type of screw system Mm. that was going to work. The problem they were having is that they, the screw that they had then was, like, the screw I'm holding right now, which is, like, imagine that this was a, the screw head itself was a little bit thinner, but there was no variation in thickness. Just like one stick that goes straight down, right? And it has threads on it. And then the head is very thin. If you put a notch in there, well, the head is going to break off. Mm. And that was the problem that they were having. They were trying to put some type of notches in it to be able to turn it more effectively. But they couldn't figure it out and how to mass produce it. Until Robertson came around. There's a lot of people besides Robertson who did it. And I'm going to fucking say his name right before I mess this up. And do me a favor, Danny, make some mouth noises. <laughs> Danny, no, you took it too far. <laughs> Danny, you took it too far. You always got to go too far, Danny. By mouth noises, did you mean words? You know, yeah, I, um. I meant I meant words. But the, the Robertson became a really well-known bit back in this time period, okay? If I say the Robertson, do either of you know what I'm talking about? No. I bet you Canadians do. Because it is the most well-known screwdriver bit in the Canadian world. This is wild. But in the U.S., most people don't know what the Robertson is. The Robertson is what you would call a square bit. Okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. square bits are more common now. I think, like, circa the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because you see way more in furniture than you used to. It's really you get so much torque. Like the things the, you use, the hex screw. Like no, that's way different. A hex, a hex screw is different than a square bit. A square bit has four corners. A hex will have like eight. Right, right, eight is it, or is it six? I don't know. I'm not a fucking mathetician. Hex is six. Okay, fuck you, Thank Danny. You. Okay, I thank you, Danny. That, actually. Okay, yeah, then why'd you make that comment? Because I, I just keep thinking <laughs> about all the furniture I put together, and they always send you the little like. But that's not a hex screw though. It's a what is the little. Allen key? Yes. Yeah, Allen key or hex key. Oh, my God. They're called hex keys. That's oh. They sure are. Yeah. Hex keys. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so smart. But all that being said, the Robertson became really well-known in Canada, like super-duper well-known. And we'll get to why in a hot second. But that's like the first bit that really was kind of taking more precedent because the way that it was made is it had like a triangle going into the rest of the screw. So it was manufactured in a way that had more thickness on the sides. So you could notch it on top and it won't break the head. And so much fucking torque. Like you can really get some good torque out of that. I don't know if either of you know what a torque bit is. If I say that, do you know what it is? No, but I'm going to look it up like I have everything else. Hold on. I literally have iFixit toolkit right here. Wow. I, I know. I know. I fix it. I want you to know I'm sourcing a lot of this stuff from iFixit's website. Really great articles about bits and the history of bits. Highly recommend. And we're not being directly like given money to talk about this. I just like talking about history so much. But Danny, I need you to use mouth noises while I figure this out. Da, 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 da. Words, Danny. <laughs> words. <laughs> Danny. Okay. Words. Okay. 
we so in the pre-show after show we talked about what kinds of dogs different content creators would be danny wh- what kind of dog would you be i am a golden retriever and i know this about myself mm. i am just dumb and happy and want everyone to have a good time what what kind of dog are you bass Oh, gosh. We we talked about this on the way back from Ottawa, and we came up with an answer. I don't know if it's the best answer. What was it? Scotty? Is that what we decided? You're, you're Scottish. You're Was it a Scottish Terrier or an Australian Terrier? No, I think I think we said Scotty. Yeah, you're a Scottish Terrier. I think it was because, like, they look really smart. I was going to say, you kind of look like one. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a Scottish Terrier vibe, don't they? <laughs> but also, like... They're they they they're literally bred to do a specific job, right? They're in they they look incredibly smart. Mm, you know, are they? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But also, they're adorable. They're like sweet and loyal and kind, but reserved. So yeah. Good at a job with very distinct style. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I nice. I liked it very distinct. Well, okay, cool. Mine wasn't nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what am I then? I said it during the after show pre show, but what am I? You said you were a Saint Bernard, which I could see. Okay. Um, wow. I feel like the fact that both of you are struggling hurts my heart a lot. It's cause you don't seem like a dog, okay? Yeah. What 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 am I then? You're a cat. You think I'm a cat? Mm. Fuck you both. That's very cat of me, isn't it? <laughs> you get mad about it. What? You're the black cat friend, and I'm the golden retriever friend, and oh. it works for us. What is the black? What is that? What is a black cat friend? Um, suspicious of strangers. Um, <laughs> wants to be <laughs> left the fuck alone. <laughs> you want to be left the fuck alone. <laughs> oh shit! I am getting called out hard. <laughs> but also demands attention when you want attention. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa! Yeah, ouch! But real. Why is that ouch? I respect I, those qualities in you. They it, balance me well. Yeah, mm. I guess. Okay, okay. One last thing. What is Matthew? What kind of dog is our sound person? Matt's like a lizard or something. I don't know. Matt's a lizard. That tracks. <laughs> <laughs> I think Matt's a bearded dragon. Yeah, for sure. It's I kind was... of amazing we kept him alive this long. <laughs> I was going to say like a gecko, but yeah. Oh, yeah. No, 100% a bearded dragon. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. like they defy logic. <laughs> but also, I don't know, beard, be- beardies are pretty loved, right? Like, I think most people like beardies. I'm thinking specifically of your spouse mouse and the beardie that they kept alive for like 20 years. Yeah. Way longer than it should have been alive. Yeah, weirdly enough, my spouse mouse, Zizi, had to like inject their bearded dragon for, with like for years. For literally years with a syringe, like daily, I think, like underneath their scale and some yes. shit. And I believe that the bearded dragon was blind for the last like three years of her life. And they kept it alive for so long anyway. Uh, yeah. Wild. Wild. Anyway, Matt, we're going to keep you alive forever. Thank you. I get to watch <laughs> the universe die. <laughs> That was the most Doctor Who way of saying that shit. That was wild, Maddie. Okay. Wait, but just, Matt, make sure you bring a spray bottle with you because, you know. Yeah, we got to stretch that skin out and make sure that. Yeah. Oh, shit. (laughs) Guys, this guy, T, I feel like 10% of the audience knows what the fuck we're talking about at this point. Oh, man. Okay, anyways, so here's the bits I'm talking about. This is a torque bit. I don't know what you would even call, how you would describe this. Show me you your bits. To... Ooh, Danny. This okay. So for for a verbal description, it looks kind of like a little sun, but with like a circle in the middle and like six points sticking out from it. Yes, that is what you would call. Uh, this is actually technically a security torque bit because of the little hole in the center. These are super handy if you don't want anyone to open up your shit, right? Like if you design something. That is not meant to be taken apart. This is the one you want to use. Mm. I don't know exactly when. Matt, did we look this up before when these torque bits were actually coming out? Can you look that up for me, Maddie? When these I were, will look it up. I think torque bits, I want to say torque bits were designed in the 80s. They feel like an 80s thing to me. As the, like, the rise of like TVs and the rise of like radios, I would, have, I would feel like there would be a need to have a bit. That would they be were more. developed in 1967. Ooh, okay. But they when they started probably becoming more popular in the 70s and 
80s then probably right I mean, 67 lines up with, like, more technology. Yeah, I mean, if you do 67, secured. by the time the 80s come along, it kind of makes sense. That yep. makes sense. Okay, so this is what this is the classic Phillips head that we're talking about, okay? Now, originally, the Phillips was designed after the Robertson, okay? So you would think that Phillips would have less of, a like, a, a staying power than the Robertson, right? The problem is the Robertson, which is this one I'm holding right now, is a square bit, right? The Robertson was the first choice of Henry Ford. The problem is there's almost like too much torque to this thing, mm. right? It would actually end up like it, it was a great, like, you know, Henry Ford, super well known for assembly lines, all that jazz, good shit. You would, it sounds like in theory, this would be good for them, right? But in World War One. The, the, the folks who made the Robertson got kind of fucked over by the Russians, okay? Uh, and they they kind of weren't able to make things work the way they wanted it to. They lost a lot of money. So they were by the time they came back here to North America, they were really reluctant to give away their rights to their patents to Henry Ford and to give him exclusive rights, right? Because they were going to give... He wanted them to be like, no... I will give you this money and you will do it, but you will only do it for me and no one else. Okay. So that became a no go for them and they wouldn't do it. So they lost like ended up 30% of their entire market share in Canada, which was their biggest stuff because Henry Fold pulled out completely. Mm. And they are now really well known in Canada and basically nowhere else. Now in the flip side, during this time period, someone else was kind of inventing some shit. Okay. Oh, hold on. Danny, make some noises. Was it Philip? It was not necessarily Philip. Interesting. I know, Danny, we're getting to that. Okay. Why do you keep asking the autistic one in the room to come up with words on the fly? Yeah, because I know if I asked Basil, it would be way worse. <laughs> <laughs> You're the most entertaining person out of the, the, the two of you, okay? okay? Basil is, like, really well thought out, very smart, very, like, I mean, honestly, like, absolutely wonderful. Basil and, has their shit together. I am a dancing monkey. You will 100%. <laughs> I need you to slap those symbols together. I need Basil to make sure we have symbols to begin with. <laughs> okay, so John P. Thompson is the dude who invented the Phillips head, right? But when he invented it, it was way more like a star. Like, if you look at a Phillips head right now, if you look at it, it doesn't look like a cross bit as much because over time they got a little bit more flared out. But he made it more star-based back in the day, right? Now, this was really good because you had a, a very definite point. You know, you had a very strong point, and that pressure meant that you could really make sure that it was always centered right in the middle of the screw. Mm. And that meant it, it was really easy to torque it, and you put a lot of pressure on it, and you make sure it was nice and tight. You can make those damn things real tight, get a good amount of torque. But it would do something called caming out. If I say caming out, do you two know what I'm talking about? Is mm -mm. this a term you... Nope. Came you, you were making fun of me for my vocabulary earlier, by the way. I, I just know. want to point that out. I know. I was making fun of you. But also, my vocabulary is cool. Yours oh. is, like, instantly kind of nerdy, as all I'm saying. Girl. Uh, <laughs> all of your fun facts are about tools. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that makes you cool, honey. I, I love know. you, but I don't think that Danny, makes you cool. Danny, I don't know. I think, hey, you know what? I grew up watching Home Improvement. Two, Tim and Two Main Taylor. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know? I'm saying. Honey, you lost me. I'm so sorry. Oh, I know. I was, I was there with you. <laughs> I watched that too. <laughs> Basil. Basil, I love you so much. Okay. I forgot where we were. Where were we? Caming out. Yes. Caming came out. out. Came out. Not, so, as, not to be confused with coming out, which we have all done at least a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what? Kind of the same thing. Okay. Okay. We, you could say that we um, cammed out. Okay. And what that means is that we slipped out. <laughs> oh, wait. Kind of. <laughs> Are kinda. you telling me that uh, caming out is when your bits slip out? Yeah. <laughs> it is when my bits slip out. You know what? It's kind of like when you tuck and <laughs> you jump into the pool and you weren't planning it out. And there's some, like, there's a bunch of people around you. And you jump in a pool because you only decided to wear one very tight, uh, you know, thing. And then, you know, 
things came out. They came out. <laughs> they came out. Not speaking from our experience or anything. This uh, is the most trans handyman content. <laughs> <laughs> the intersection right here. <laughs> okay. okay so what is caming out? C A M out. Caming out. The way that this works is that it basically means the bit would just popped out when it's overly torqued, when it's torqued all the way. This is where the design is actually more suitable for Henry Ford and the assembly line than the square bit or the Robertson bit. Because it cams out, it actually saves them cost. It saves them time and money and materials. Because that means it just it just like it would go all the way it could and it would just stop naturally when it's all the way in. Mm. Now the thing that's great about that is that helps them from a manufacturer's standpoint. But if anyone has ever seen like a stripped screw and you can't get the fucking screw out, it happens because of came out. It like mm. it literally happens because it just like slips out and it rounds out the actual mm. like slot itself. That is a goddamn nightmare. Not my favorite. That's why torque bits and square bits are more commonly used now on construction sites a lot because they they, they prevent you from having that issue. If you stripped a screw, boy, that's just a goddamn nightmare. Questions. I feel like you have questions on your mind. I'm realizing through the course of this story that the stupid little joke that Matt made earlier about Henry Ford using Phillips screw heads was maybe not a stupid little joke and was actually a fun fact uh, and was quite serious. No, he was serious. Did you think he was joking? I thought that was a joke. You thought Matt was joking? Yeah, it, I did. Is that is Matt? That funny of a person that you think he would have made that joke? I don't know. The universe ending one was pretty funny. No. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> Matt, do you have any more tidbits of knowledge that you want to put out that people are going to think are jokes? No, I don't remember anything else you told me before. So. <laughs> <laughs> Matt! Matt, you weren't supposed to tell them that! <laughs> and the mystery is solved that Mercury's just planting people with intelligence. So, um, Phillips screwdrivers, they came out. Yeah. I'm coming out. Do, 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 Happy do, do, Pride. Pride all year. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's what made them good for the assembly line. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. And then became like really popular during that time period. And now they're probably the most widely used bit in the world. Like they're, they're, they're kind of universal. Like if you look into your glove box in your car or if you look into your like drawer of tools and things that you just forget that you have. You more than likely have a Phillips bit. Now, you don't have like a square bit more than likely unless you've got a 10 in 1 screwdriver, which I always recommend getting because you really never know what you're going to fucking get, right? But yeah, I mean, they're, they're one of the most common things. And because they're so easily made, like manufactured, there's, they're generally a lot easier to manufacture than a lot of the other ones did. And during this time period, the 1920s and 30s, that they kind of like skyrocketed. I believe that Henry Ford basically went with the Phillips bit, but it wasn't really them that popularized. It was GM who used it on one of their very first cars, and the whole car was used in a Phillips, and that was in the 1930s. So pretty f fucking fascinating and wild ride. And it's weird to think that like Phillips we had had only been around for like 50 years by the time that I got born. So I was born in 1987, right? At that point in time, they've only been around for like 50 years universally. I think it's weird when we like look at this stuff that it's like we just take this for granted. We don't mm -hmm. even think about what the history of this and why we have this bit. And I think when we look at like this little thing I got from iFixit here that I don't know how many different ones are in here. But like you, you could you name more than four of the different kind of bits? In I there? definitely couldn't. I don't think I could name four. No. And all these different bits are used for so, for so many different things. Like we talked about security bits, but there's a whole bunch of different ones in here for various kinds of torques. There's ones in here that are like literally designed to be able to use for appliances and stuff like that. And all that is because like you want different kind of torques, but you also want it to stop at a certain point. All that kind of stuff is something you think about. But if you don't want anyone to open it, you really want it to be a specific kind of bit that you can only find in certain locations, right? That's why iFixit is really handy because they give you so many options to open it up and they believe in it. Be able to fix something that you own. If you buy it, you should be able to fix it. It's that kind of mentality. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Questions. 
What are your questions? I feel like there must be something out there looking for it. Looking for it. What is the craziest looking bit that you that you think? What's the craziest looking bit yeah, that yeah. I think out there? I don't know if I know all their fucking names, to be honest. But I would say, to me, I think that the craziest dash most useful is the torque bit that we were talking about. Mm. I think that, you know, like, it looks like a sun. But I'm telling you, the other day I was using this because we were making the, the cat trees that now are at home, right? And we had a six-inch screw to put in through the arms to make the ladder, the cat ladder that I made, that you can see on my Instagram dash TikTok. And when you have a screw that long, you need to have enough torque to go through the wood, right? You just need to be able to have enough power. And when I say torque, I mean, like, I don't know. Matt, you might want to look up the actual definition of torque. But from the way that I can kind of, like, distill this information is torque is basically think of the power that something has when it twists and turns. Okay, Basil, what's the fucking definition of it? A twisting force that tends yeah. to cause rotation. Yeah. And the more torque you have, the more rotation you have, so the more depth you can get, right? So it can sink into the wood or it can drive all the way into the metal or whatever you're having, right? So when you have something that's six inches and it's a thick fucking screw, right? You're going to need to have something that has more torque to it. And that's where these fucking things come in hand. What, what are you, you going to say? <laughs> what are you going to say? Thick and six inches is just how I like them. You know what, Danny? Danny. <laughs> every time that you're on the podcast, every time I'm kind of like ashamed of myself. You we invited were. me back. Not only did you invite me once, but you invited me back. And I that did. was a choice that you made. Okay. What do you think, Basil? Should we have them back again? I mean, I mean, yeah. Oh. You're going to live in a car with me for four months. I, I got to tell you, the book tour is going to be good. Oh, I'm so excited. I think we should segue just for a moment because it's my podcast. I can do what I want to talk about the book tour. Now that we talked about all the bits in the world, let's do another bit and talk about what our favorite locations are going to be when oh. we are on the tour. Now, do we all know where we're going? I mean, do the do the three of us know? For those who don't know, we're going to 52 cities. There's an infographic about it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go to 52 cities this fall. And we just announced it this past weekend or like a week or so ago on 4th of July. We announced actually where we were going to go. So if you want to find out what cities we're going to be at, go to my Instagram and you'll see more information there. But we're going to go to 52 cities in a course of four months and to promote my book, Safe and Sound, A Renter's Guide to Home Maintenance. And all that being said, there are a lot of places we're going to go to, and a lot of them are not larger markets. For those who don't know, and that's a lot of you, we actually had people on Instagram vote for us. So we had almost 3,000 people submit requests for us to go to independent queer-owned bookstores across the country. And that's how we made this list happen, was largely from our audience. I wanted to go where you wanted me to go, and that's why we picked some of these out. I think the most requested, or one of the most requested locations, was Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm -hmm. Wild. But we got like, I don't know, like 70, 80, maybe 90? It was a lot. I and mean, We might have actually gotten the hundreds for that one. It was wild. I remember Maggie telling me that it was like, a crazy amount of people were asking us to go to Salt Lake City. And we originally, I don't think we were going to. And then that made me go, well, we have to now. We can't get that many requests and not do it. Is Salt Lake City just like secretly super gay? I've never been. Well, here's the thing. I think the most requests we got were from locations that were either really small and were lacking queer representation mm -hmm. or were from locations that are going through an extremely hard time for the LGBTQ community. Yep. And I think that that, that says volumes. So the, some, the, the most requested ones, mostly, not all of them, but some of the most requested ones were in spaces that you, you wouldn't think so. Peoria, Illinois mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was another one that was extremely well requested. What, okay, okay. I, I'm i going to say where, where I'm most excited to go to, but what are the ones that you two are most excited to go to first? I'm most excited for Seattle because I just have so many friends that live over there because I used to live over there. Yeah. So I'm very excited. To we're see going that. to Seattle twice. Twice. Yeah, yeah. we're going to go to Seattle in the book tour one and book tour four. So 
the way that this is going to work is we're going to start on August 22nd and we're going to go for about two weeks. Take two weeks off, take two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, et cetera. All the way until like mid-December. Okay. Danny's our security and our driver. Basil's going to be like our coordinator and Mercury happy. Uh, and then Mercury is going to be zoned out and very tired for most of the trip. And somehow mostly covered in makeup for most of it. I don't know how. My theory is I'm going to be in full face the entire time somehow. Don't know how that's going to happen. You're going to have the most regimented skincare routine by the time we're done. Oh, yeah. Uh, 100%. And my face, either it's going, I'm going to somehow, my face is going to be amazing by the time that we're done with this and my skin is going to be great or my skin is going to be fucked up and mad at the end of this. You know what my favorite skincare tip is? Yeah. Use olive oil to take your makeup off. Mm. Wait, what? I, I have done that and it does work. We've been doing micellar <laughs> water. Mm. And that works pretty well too. <laughs> I tend I start with olive oil to get like the big chunky bits off because mm-hmm. it takes it off and then I wash with micellar water out. Hold on. Gotcha, gotcha. The, guys. <laughs> I, hold on, I feel like you two are doing a bit because <laughs> <laughs> hold on the way you two sound like um the SNL bit from my salty balls. <laughs> <laughs> like you're like mm-hmm, yeah uh huh mm-hmm, yeah like you guys sound like you should be like an NPR <laughs> like, like show hey, I'll take that <laughs> yeah, sure and I want you're you to good. know we started this episode talking about screwdrivers and bits and now we're ending it with makeup advice I tell you the trans handyman brand is wide you know it's very <laughs> wide we can do a lot with, with, with a lot of things we've talked about bits we've talked about other bits we've talked about. <laughs> Dogs. We've done bits. We've, We've done had dogs. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. I'm excited for all of the West Coast states. Mm. I love Seattle. I love Portland. I love uh, San Francisco and LA. Those are going to be fun. I'm also excited for Austin. Fuck Texas, but Austin's a cool city, and I'm excited that we're going to places that definitely need more queer events and queer mm. and trans mm-hmm. representation. I agree with all that, but I mean, that's like generally why we're we're going to some of those locations. I think the cities that are under like 60, 50,000 people mm-hmm. are the ones that I'm most excited about. Like Ottawa, Illinois, I'm excited about. I don't know how big Winston Salem is in North Carolina. Is that like the spooky Salem? Or is, no. No, that's in Massachusetts. No, that's right? in Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. Winston Salem is a smaller town in North Carolina. And people would ask me, they're all like, they were already asking me, like, why? And the reason why is, is honestly because people request it so much. And because we were the way that this works, we're going to so many cities that we're going to go to one location to another location. It was natural just to add in another location. Like this is like two or three hours out of like the D.C. area or something. It made sense for us to be like, oh, why not? Why not? You know. I also have lots of friends in Pennsylvania. That'll be fun to to visit. Yeah, 100 percent. I think we are going to take a short break and then we're going to get back to everybody. Because the reason why we're taking a short break <laughs> is it looks like Basil's going to pee himself. I <laughs> would pee so this is, this is why Basil <laughs> is not on the podcast all the time. If they were, we wouldn't even be taking a break every 15 fucking minutes. I literally went to the bathroom right before we started I know, recording. but I'm not going to lie. Now that you're talking, I have to pee too. God. Me three. God damn it, guys! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Basil, for advocating for your bodily okay. needs. It made space for all of us too. We Thank are going to take a break, yeah. and then we're going to come on and answer two questions, and then we're going to get going for the day. How about that? That sounds great. What a well-thought-out plan I just thought of right now. Yeah, let's go. So the funniest thing happened when we were peeing. Uh, (laughs) There were three stalls, and we were uh, spread across the three of them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and then we were all talking, and it occurred to us, I never explained why it's named a Philip Screwdriver. Like, why is named a Philip Screwhead? I never explained that. And I think that's hilarious that I told you the entire history of the screw, uh, but not why it got named that. So, here's the thing. Uh, Danny, make mouth noises. <laughs> Mercury, Mercury, stardust. You're the beacon of hope in this dark-ass room. Mercury, Mercury, stardust, we're in a basement. (laughs) That was really good. I'm like, you know what? Way to go. Danny, you missed your calling. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I really think you're going to be the Lizzo of our generation. Wait. wait, wait. <laughs> I'm just wait. here for commercial jingles, y'all. Wait, isn't Lizzo the Lizzo of our generation? <laughs> yes. Correct. Yes. <laughs> I cannot play the flute. Not at oh, all. Oh, yeah. God. No. Okay. So um, the wonderful John P. Thompson was not making like any money on this. He was not doing a great job. Okay. No one wanted this. So this other dude, uh, Henry F. Phillips, came around and actually realized that the little star bit design that he had going on originally, Thompson did, uh, just wasn't necessarily the most conducive. So all he did was make it a little bit thinner and a little bit more, like, crossy, right? Like a little bit more X-E. And that simple design became what we now know as the Phillips screwdriver. So Thompson sold it to this guy. Um... And Phillips was like, okay, I'll take it. And then he put his name on it. And it was like one of the biggest regrets for Thompson in his entire life. I bet. Because um, Phillips made like a lot of money from this. Uh, tons of money. And the, the thing about him is he didn't give a shit. Robertson, uh, who invented the Robertson, you know, like square bit that we were talking about, had a lot of integrity, really wanted to make sure that his name stay attached to it and a patent to it. Um, where Phillips just didn't give a shit. He sold out as fast as he could. Uh, and then in, instead of like being the one who actually made the screw, he wasn't. He only owned the patent. So all he did was basically give them the design, and he got money for each one of the screws. So yeah. some Elon Musk shit. Some ve- this was some straight up Elon Musk. Like I feel up v- very much this dude Henry Phillips was the Elon Musk of his time. (laughs) Okay, all that being said, now that I've officially given you all the knowledge about screws, and I feel like we're all screwed out, okay? (laughs) I feel like, now let's end the podcast with, like, answering one or two questions, okay? Now, Maddie, Maddie Ice. Yes? Do you have a question or two for me to answer? I do. Would you like me to play them now? Okay, are you two ready to help me answer questions? Oh, I have no knowledge, and I'm so prepared to use I it. feel like having you two <laughs> together could not be worse for me. At this point. <laughs> like, I feel like having two sidekicks like you it would would have gotten Batman killed. I'm pretty. <laughs> wow! Wow! I'm, I'm pretty positive. Basil I'm, is the brains behind the organization, and I'm the one you send out when you need to talk your way out of something. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basil is definitely Dick Grayson. No, wait, no. You're definitely Dick Grayson, and you're definitely Damien. You're Damien. I am honored. I want to be Dick Grayson so bad. Yeah. He's so hot. Yeah, so Basil is Damien Wayans yeah. because extremely intelligent, kind of socially awkward. And then Danny is very much Dick Grayson, can do a lot of cool stuff. But maybe, maybe not the brightest one in the room. Hot, charismatic, got a great bulge. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> I would like everyone to know Mercury has left her microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you want to answer uh, some questions? Yeah, let's answer some questions. Matt, play the, play the audio, please. Hi, my name is Vincent. I use he, him, and blue, blue pronouns. And I wanted to know how to hang up LED lights without peeling the paint off the walls because I've been struggling with that for a minute. And then also, I've tried to come out to my parents quite a few times, and they're not supportive at all. So I wanted to know how I could learn to manage that and try to, like, I don't know, just, like, try to cope with it in a sense, if that makes any sense. So like I said, my name is Vincent. I use he, him, and blue, blue. And, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we got two very, very different questions here. We got a question about LED lighting, and we got a question about coming out, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. All right, good. Sometimes people call in, and I'm not quite sure what they're saying, because I am deaf in one of my ears, so it makes it very difficult to know what they're saying. So I'm going to throw this out there real quick. Never peel off the back of LED strips. Don't do it. If you're living in an apartment building, don't peel off the back, okay? What you want to do is either you want to get the kind that don't have any sticky back at all, which is honestly what I would advise, or you don't want to take off the back. The reason why is because the adhesive that they have on there is way more semi-permanent than any of the other stuff that we're going to suggest in a second here. 
So don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay? Or, or get yourself some command strips. Command strips are the way that I would go. Command strips are nice because if you pull it from the, the side, like the, if you leave the tab on, don't cut the tab off as a lot of people do. Leave the tab on, stretch it all the way, and then pull it, pull it towards you. That will pop it off and you're able to take it off. If you do that, like if you put them on every like six months to a year, you'll be okay. If you leave them on in a high humidity area, they will sink into the paint and become a part of that drywall and become a part of that cardboard. And they will rip the cardboard, right? Remember, drywall itself is only a thin layer of cardboard, plaster in the middle, and then a thin layer of cardboard. It does not take much for that adhesive to sink into that cardboard through the two or three layers of paint you got on it. Okay, so you really don't want to use that kind of adhesive that's going to go and sink into it and then rip it. That would be the, like the worst thing you could do. I would even argue, I think pin nails are way more effective. I highly suggest pin nails for stuff in general. What I would do if I was a renter, right, I would get myself some like one by twos, a bunch of one by twos, cut them up, okay, and then get pin nails and pin nail them to the wall. And then put the strip of the LED on top of that. Does that make sense to you two? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So that way, that one by two, you can paint that, make it look decorative, or whatever you want. But then that is actually preventing it from being damaged. Then you get one little hole that will actually not even be seen by most mm -hmm. people. Those pinholes are super, like it's a thumbtack almost. Mm -hmm. You barely see them. And it, LEDs are almost always up and out of the way. Mm -hmm. You won't typically see those. And I think that would be the best route to go. I think even with command strips, you run the risk of ripping in, in that cardboard. So that would be my hot take. Just to like piggyback off the pin nails, there's also like those cable, what are they called? The little bracket things, the that's cable, what you're talking about? The little mm -hmm. cable management ones. They do yeah. make some that are wide enough that you could fit over an LED strip. We, at the bar I work at, we just put up new LEDs under the bar to light up where the sink is. And that's what we did is we used the little cable management things. That's what I was going to say. If you can put a hole in the wall, that those work quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, my, my route is always, I think holes are better than than adhesives mm -hmm. and the reason why i think holes are better than adhesive is just because like it, it just makes way more sense for something as light and has that much surface area like when, when we're talking about like again don't put the the nail through <laughs> the led strip itself right. right but when we're talking about this you're going to have a nice long like strip of of led to me it makes more sense to put something there, even if you want to put, let's say, poster board. Cut poster board up, right, the, the, the width that you need, and then stick it to that, and then just nail the poster board to it. That might work really well, too. I, I think those things are way more long-term friendly, and I would rather cover up, like, seven or eight pin nails than having to cover up one big batch of you know, adhesive gone wrong, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Everyone always wants to go the sticky route. But be, I don't think people understand that cardboard is all that's on your wall. It's It will rip. It will flip and rip. And I know there's a lot of things that will, like are on the market that aren't supposed to do it. But uh, to me, it, it's that those are in ideal conditions. If you're in a high humid area that is full of heat and stuff too, that it's just going it's just not the way that works you know it can easily go awry so that's the road i have better to fill a hole than to make it sticky <laughs> yeah, oh my god danny <laughs> everyone i hope you're enjoying the last time that danny will ever be on this podcast <laughs> okay okay we answered the led strip one mm -hmm. now i'm going to turn this over to you two to help me answer how to come out like, well, how to cope with not coming out, essentially, right? Is that what the question is? Basically, Vincent has come out to their parents multiple times. It just hasn't worked, right? Yeah. What I heard was that uh, Vincent said that he has tried to come out to his parents a couple times and that they have been generally unsupportive, and he is asking how to handle that and or how to cope with that. Yeah, I think coming out to your parents multiple times says it all. 
Mm. Like, right, like, when you have to come out to people multiple times for them to fully understand. That, like, says kind of what the relationship is, says what their feelings are towards it. And either they're not well rehearsed enough in understanding what their identity really is, right? Because that is some, that's the reality that a lot of us as queer people encounter, right? They're not taking our identities seriously. Or, or uh, they don't give a shit. Uh, and neither of them are great answers. Basil, what do you got? You got, you got some knowledge to give. I I just want to say, you know, I feel like it's important to kind of examine your relationship with your parents and like what you're getting out of that relationship from them. You know, I, I like to look at my relationships as, as like y- you want more positive the negative right and if if you're not getting enough of support if you're not if that relationship is not actually helpful for you you know maybe it's okay to take a step back i think all three of us have pulled away from our parents in various ways right yeah so i think like there is no better question to ask the three of us in a lot of ways i would echo everything that basil just said i think that like all because they're our parents doesn't automatically make them deserving of our time and our energy and our like love. You know, I think that in a perfect world, it would be. That just isn't reality, right? A parent's job, in my opinion, is to keep you alive, <laughs> right? And to love and to care for you. I think that those last two parts are often forgotten about and the first one is the only only one that they focus on and i think that just isn't really how this works i feel like as kids all three of us have faced trauma from our parents in various different ways famously for me i haven't spoken to my dad in literally years at this point and he's the last parent i got right i think for me i don't seek his approval I don't care about his approval. It's not going to happen. I wish he could be in my life. But I don't want someone in my life who doesn't see me as who I really am and how I operate within the world. All he does is hold me back. He doesn't really help me go forward in the world. Mm. Right? I agree with that. I have come out to my parents a couple times. And they still won't use my pronouns accurately. And I think that the way that I have best been able to reframe this and cope with it is that access to you and your authentic self and access to your identity is a privilege. Mm. And Ooh. Ooh, snap, snap. those who do not or sometimes just cannot based on where they are at in their own healing journeys hold space for your authentic self don't deserve to be given the opportunity to and this doesn't have to be like an always thing right it, it can be just like it's this is not a healthy place for you to be right now you know yeah i think protect your peace protect your peace protect your mind and that i think as queer people in the age that we live in right now our survival is more important than someone else's comfort and if our parents are uncomfortable because of how we are choosing to live our life and protect our peace that's a them problem, not a you problem. And I think often parents like, I think parents in this situation will project on us. And that just hurtens, it hurts us and weighs us down. And right now, queer people need to be as light as possible for us to be able to blow with the winds of hate that are happening around us. We need to be able to bend and sway in the breeze. And we can't do that if we have all this weight and tension from our people around us who we we either don't need or we can live without and that's a hard thing you know like I, that's a rough sauce my gosh to say but i think there's a lot of truth there that i don't think that as queer people it's our job to make our parents feel good about the work that they've done <laughs> you know what i mean we're the ones living with their decisions we didn't really have a choice upon how they raised us so i don't know that's rough sauce I would say figure out what your boundaries are in what will keep you feeling safe and comfortable. And a lot of these things are very nuanced. And there are sometimes that like going low contact or no contact with your parents is not viable and or unsafe. Mm. But 
Figure out what your boundaries are that can keep you safe in that relationship and remember that you deserve to uphold them and that you deserve to be treated the way that you want to be treated. And also, sometimes you just got to remember that your parents are just some guy. They're they're, it, they're literally just some guy. And they don't have to be your everything and or your family, even if you don't want them to be. They can be, absolutely. And sometimes putting the work in for that relationship is worth it. But sometimes they're just some guy. On that note, let's listen to some guy Woo! asking us more questions about about home repair. I might try my best to, to segue, but in the reality, it's... All these kind of questions we get, I feel like we're fixing, you know, sinks and we're fixing hearts all at the same time. And I think that often we don't realize how connected the two are. I think that this is a reason why the Trans Handyman brand and what we're doing as a company matters so much. Because I think when we're talking about these subjects, there is correlations to this. When we're asked, oh, how do we do this problem? How do we fix this thing? And they come to us strangers on the internet rather than asking people in their life to help them. I think that says a lot. And I think that this is why we exist. And I just want to say, Vincent, thank you so much for asking that question. And I send you all my love. And I know that you are seen, you are heard. And I hope that we're lighting up your life like the LED strips that you are going to hang up. Cute. Yeah. Good segue. Way to tie together. Speaking of tying together, let's tie it up with the next question. Oh, shit. I really didn't stick that landing. Hi, this is Morgan from Maryland. I use she, her pronouns. And I was just wondering about at my home, the previous homeowner did a lovely job of painting everything and so they painted the trim but then got a lot of paint along the floor which is a laminate they got it on our window sills and i'm just wondering what the most effective way to remove that paint is without me inadvertently you know cutting through the laminate if i tried to use a box cutter or i don't know ruining my window sill um thank you this is such a good question please do not take a knife to this please <laughs> Don't do it. No, here's the thing. Uh, on the laminate itself, you might actually be able to just take some type of rag that has like an abrasiveness to it and just rub it with your your thumb and actually get it off. It, it, you'd be amazed how much work that will actually do. I will also say that you could probably get it just by taking your thumb and doing it a little bit. Now, you're showing me some great photos, Matthew. Thank you so much. You can really see that it's like right up against the corner. You can do a couple things. Depending on how old it is, I think the acetone will do a pretty good job. Acetone is a chemical. You might want to use a respirator for it because you're going to have some pretty hard smells with it. So depending on how old this is, you can get some type of sponging that has a, a 90 degree angle to it and soak that in acetone. And then use that to, like, sponge away at it. You don't want to, like, hit the actual corners too much. But what you can do is take tape, right? Take, like, frog tape, painter's tape. Put that on the trim. And then get that acetone nice and close to it. And just, like, sponge it out. Once you get it soaked in it, then you can take a rag away from it. Or even, like, a toothbrush. And rub that. And you'll get a lot of that out. Toothbrush, rags, and acetone will do the trick a lot. Matt, that's a great photo. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can see, I would say, what, there is like maybe like a quarter inch of paint on that laminate all the way across. Yeah, quarter and inch. And it looks like there's like a ledge a little bit that can kind of go in there, like there's a space between the laminate and the actual, you know, trim itself. Do you think maybe trying like one of the, like the like putty um, things? A plastic putty knife? Yeah. So, yeah, you could. You totally could. You don't want to get one that has too much of a, an edge to it because you will, even plastic will sometimes tear at that. Right, that laminate can be. Yeah. What you want, though, is no matter what, you want the acetone on there first. You want it to get saturated because that will make the process of using a plastic putty knife a little bit easier, right? And you pick a direction and you kind of go in. Does that make sense? Yeah, Danny? What are your thoughts on paint strippers? And is there a reason that you're uh, recommending acetone over like what, like orange gunk that you put on paints? This is such a good question. I think acetone is really like it can damage stuff really quickly. Right. But that's why I like it. Less is more. 
you can use very little acetone and make things work, right? Like you just start small, see how much it, you need to, to get it away naturally by dabbing it, right? The problem with strippers, and I think a lot of people in my industry will say the same thing. The problem with paint strippers, I got to be specific with the three of us in a room together. <laughs> you the, saw the look on our faces yeah, when you yeah. said. <laughs> the problem with paint strippers, God damn it, we're talking to former sex workers, I swear <laughs> to God. Okay, so the, 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 the problem with paint strippers themselves, okay, is that often you need a lot of them to be able to, you need a lot of it to be able to get older paint away. This looks pretty dried. It looks like it might be pretty old. You're going to have a hard time with that, right? And a paint strippers, to me, it just, you end up damaging things more because you use too much of it. Mm. Acetone can certainly damage stuff. But to me, is the equivalent of like, you know, when you're cutting something, sometimes it's you're almost more likely to cut yourself with a small knife than you are to cut yourself with a big knife because you're more careful with a big knife. That's how I feel with this. Like when I'm using a jigsaw, there's like a lot more accents with jigsaws than there are with table saws, which is mind blowing. But that's true, right? Because you have less, you're not focusing as much when you're working with a jigsaw and you should be, right? So I think with this one specifically, I think that's the road I'm, that I think is the right road to go. Paint strippers are a lot more trouble than they're worth. I, I just want to mention, too, I think um, like if when you're starting this project, if you can start somewhere like maybe behind a door or something, oh, yeah. you know, just do like a little test patch first and see how it's going to work before you go all out and like in a spot where it's really noticeable. I agree with that. I think that's really good. I always think that... thinking, always planning. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely. I, I, so this is what could happen with layman if, if you add acetone. You might get some like whiting like bleaching effect that could happen you could also like there's like a sheen on the laminate you might strip that straight off so really make sure that you dab it you don't want to overdo it here and you don't want to damage the trim either mm. right so make sure you tape the, the the part of the trim that you don't want you know like tape the trim and then add it in and then e maybe even tape you know leading up to it on the laminate you know what I mean? You can use as much tape as you want. All that's going to help to protect it and get as close to that stuff that you want to remove as possible, if that all makes sense. I have another question. I might have another answer. She also mentioned it being on her windowsills. Yes. What would you still recommend acetone for that? It all depends what her windowsill actually is. Is this plastic? Is this fiberglass? Is this wood? I think it looks like wood. Would both of you concur with me? I think so. Yeah. Now, this is the problem you're going to have. Laminate will reject it. Wood will consume it. So you're innately just going to have a harder time. I think you're better off to paint over it than you are to try to strip it off. You can try to do what Basil was saying. Go to a corner and try to chip away at it. But that's where you're going to want a knife or an X-Acto knife and try to get some of it off primer it and then paint it i think you're better off of that route than you are trying to you know get it off of that wood that makes a lot of sense yeah it's almost like i've done this before you know <laughs> i'm pretty good i'm full of screw ideas i'm full of screwy ideas and i'm happy that you were able to tune in to this handy ma'am episode oh god you know wow a part of it was good Part of it was good. Should I give it another try? It was going somewhere for a second there. It was going somewhere. Was it going to Screwville? Oh, God damn it. I don't think that's a stop on the tour. Oh, wait. A, we were callbacks <laughs> left and right. Everyone, I want to say thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Handy Ma'am Hotline. I want to say thank you so much to my co host for this episode, the wonderful Basil. Yay. And the amazing Danny. Hey. And the wonderful Matthew Ellen Hag. I'm eating a kind bar. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know when Maggie's gone, it takes three of you to replace Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. And I want to say thank you so much. You can see all three of us 
Me, Basil, and Danny on the book tour from August 22nd all the way to the middle of December. We'll be in 52 cities. You can find out that information on my Instagram at Mercury Stardust Tops. That name did not age well. And you will be able to uh, see me in person at your, hopefully your local queer bookstore. Make sure you pre-order Safe and Sound, a renter's friendly guide of home repair now. And remember, you're worth the time it takes to learn a new skill. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Do, do, do. The theme song was created by Rody Walker. Questions were picked up by our production assistant, Ziggy. A big thank you to our executive producer, Basil. And this podcast was recorded and edited by Matthew Allen Hag. Thank you for listening. See you next time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Handyman Hotline, you can listen to an even longer version by supporting us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon, $10 or more, you'll be able to get an extra long 30 to 45 minute section every single week. Isn't that amazing? More of me and Maggie. Wow! So thank you so much for all those who already support us, and you too can support us and listen to more on our Patreon. Thank you. Bye-bye. So grab your hammer and nails and paint your nails if you want to. You're worth the time it takes to be you. She'll teach you how to fix your house, how to fix it by yourself. The trans hand.